Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Good morning, church. Well, we're halfway through our studies uh, on the 23rd Psalm. It, it's really been an exciting journey so far, and really can't wait to see what God is going to do with us and in us and through us in these next few weeks. And I hope that you'll be in here with us as we go through uh, December the 13th uh, in our studies. And uh, just got a word for you this morning. Uh, my victory is not dependent on what happens at the polls across this country. My victory is in Jesus and he's in me. Amen. Amen. Um, told you in Friday email, I don't know if you read it, if you, if you don't get my Friday email, you need to get it. Uh, but I just send out a little encouraging word usually uh, every Friday morning or say something just personal, what's going on in our family and that kind of thing. But uh, I, I said a little blip in there uh, that I have a story for you today, and I really do have a great one. Um, a young single girl uh, became pregnant out of wedlock, and um, she was going to have an abortion. Now, you remember um, two years ago, uh, or actually a little over a year ago, in the golf tournament, we raised enough money to buy two ultrasound machines that God multiplied, and we were able to buy seven instead of just the two. And uh, so this young single girl, pregnant, uh, headed toward an abortion, happened to get an ultrasound. And when she saw the baby in the womb, she decided, you know, uh, I'm not going to abort this baby. I'm going to have it and adopt out and let some wonderful couple raise my child. And uh, so she went to um, an adoption center here near our church where one of our sweet uh, young members uh, works and uh, went in to tell her what happened. In the process of that, that young lady of our church led her to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we had a little bit of money left over from those uh, seven ultrasound machines. Believe that or not, we had bought seven and still had a little left over, waiting on to see what God was going to do. Well, this young lady who was pregnant, who went and got an ultrasound and decided to keep her baby ultimately was saved, was having trouble uh, paying her rent. And so we were able to pay her rent. Uh, she had enough to pay for November. She just didn't have enough to pay for one of the months that she had already uh, seen go by. But uh, your generosity has been so phenomenal that we saw a baby's life changed and saved and we saw a woman come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I just wanted to say thank you. Just wanted to say thank you. God's been so, so good and appreciate you. So if you have your Bibles now, let's look together at Psalm 23. And uh, I just want to go on down to verse 4, if that's okay with you, and just pick out, because this is the verse that is going to need more explanation than uh, any of the other verses that we've looked at so far. So watch it with me now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, I don't really have to be afraid uh, because you're with me. Now notice uh, what he says. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now just give you a little bit of a background. I brought a couple of props with me today. Um, th th this is a, more like a rod that the shepherd would hold. It's a little bit longer normally. Uh, I mean, a little bit shorter than this one. This is too long. Normally, it'd be about uh, two feet long would be about all. And um, the rod um, would be considered more of a defensive mechanism that the shepherd would hold. Now, what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, sheep are dumb, okay? They're just dumb. And they're slow, uh, they don't have any claws. Uh, they um, uh, don't have sharp teeth. The only thing they eat is grass, so they don't need sharp teeth. Uh, can't run away very fast. They're just subject uh, to all kinds of prey. And the shepherd would have a rod to ward off the wolves 
and the wild animals that would come and do harm to the sheep. He would carry a rod as a defense uh, to maybe even against another person who would come and maybe steal the sheep. So uh, he needed something to protect uh, those sheep. So this was used as a defense and as a protection for the sheep. Now the staff is a little different. Uh, the staff would be more for compassion and care. It was used more on the sheep. Uh, now these sheep would need to be guarded and guided and they need to be protected along the way. So you have the defense and for the protection. You had the shepherd's staff uh, for the care who would use it to kind of prod the sheep a little bit along the way. And also it's got that hook on it, these sheep would go over and uh, they would climb up these steep areas and, and graze up in there. And, and, the, and the shepherd would use this to help uh, rescue them from time to time. And, and he would also maybe turn it around a little bit and use it to maybe prod them uh, just a little bit. So you had the staff and you had the rod. And uh, they, they were used, this one, the rod is a symbol of power and authority. Uh, these are my sheep. I'm the shepherd. They belong to me. And I'm going to do what I got to do to protect them and to keep them safe. Power and authority. Care and compassion. Uh, so the shepherd had these at his Disposal. You may ask when you read uh, this chapter 23 and this verse number four, so what does this mean of, uh, to me in my life? Uh, what, uh, what, what can I gain from that? Uh, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Um, Jesus, if you study the New Testament, you will find that he is called the good shepherd. You'll find that he's called the chief shepherd or the great shepherd, if you will. And so you've got these terms that apply to Jesus. In John chapter 10 and verse number 11, the Bible says the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. Now, you want to understand why that he gave his life for the sheep. You go back to verse 10 in that same chapter, so that you and I could have everything that we would ever need to be sustained in this life and for the life to come. Now, we've been talking extensively about the goodness of God. As a matter of fact, that's kind of the theme throughout this chapter in Psalm 23. And I shared with you early on that there were 10 different messages that I want to bring about, about the goodness of God right out of Psalm 23. And so when you talk about thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There are five ways today that I want to share with you how that, that is demonstrated toward us. So here we go. Got a pencil? Number one, his love is given to me when I hurt. He loves me when I hurt. Now, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. For it appeared to him like they were a bunch of sheep that did not have a shepherd. That moved with care and compassion toward the sheep that were wandering aimlessly as a bunch of sheep without a shepherd. Now, there's a big difference between sympathy and empathy and compassion. Sympathy says, you know, I'm really sorry that you're going through what you're going through right now. I hate that. And you go down to Walmart or CVS or Walgreens and you go over to the Hallmark section and you buy a card and you fill it out and you address it and you send it uh, to somebody and Rick is getting ready to have some knee surgery here in a few days and you send him a card. Rick, I'm sorry that you're having knee surgery. I sympathize with you over that. 
Uh, Empathy's a little bit different. Empathy says, I'm sorry that you are going through what you are going through, and I hate it so bad I am with you in your pain. I understand what you're going through. I hurt for you. Uh, I, I get it. And I'm hurting because you are hurting. Compassion goes a lot further. Compassion goes and says, I'm sorry that you're going through what you're going through. I really hurt for you. I feel and sense and empathize with you in your pain and I will go to whatever degree I have to go to to help alleviate that pain. So you see, when you see in the passage that Jesus looked out over the multitude and he saw them. The Bible says he was moved with compassion. I hurt for you. I, 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 I sense your pain. And trust me, I'm going to go to the very depths to show you that I love you. And so to prove it to you, I will take the nails in my hands and I will take the nails in my feet. I will experience the lashing across my back that exposes my rib cage. I will go to the cross for you and die for you because of your hurt and because of your pain. Matthew 28, the Bible says he did not come here to be served, but he came here to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. Did you understand with me today, church? That's what the Christian life is all about. I come to give my life as a ransom. I have come not to be served. I have come to serve. So the Christian life is about giving and it's about serving. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you call yourself a child of the king or a Christian, then you're going to be found giving and serving because that's what Jesus did. And that's who his followers are. How many of you are here today and you're hurting? You understand, church, it's not about us. It wasn't about Jesus. He came. He was moved with compassion. He died. He had compassion for us. It was about us. It was not about him. And as a follower of Christ, this walk with Christ is not about us. It's about others, and it's about giving, and it's about serving others. How many of you are hurting this morning? You're going through issues in your life. Maybe they're relational issues. Maybe they are financial issues. Maybe they are uh, something about your career that is really got lots of question marks about it. Can I say to you this morning, God's not going to razz you or scold you or punish you or hurt you. God loves you. You understand, he loves us in the midst of our hurt. The the second thing I want to share with you this morning is that he leads me when I follow. Leads me when I follow. The Bible tells us here in this passage that he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Can I, can I just say to you, God's not going to lead you astray. He's not going to lead you in the wrong direction. He leads me in the right paths, in the way that I ought to go. Um, my, my wife and I, on our first trip to Israel, it was a bomb. It, it was just a mess. I came back from Israel not knowing much more about Israel uh, than before I ever went the first time. Really disappointing, really discouraged. But now that second trip, um, we had a guide, an Israeli guide. He was not a Christian, um, but man, was he a tremendous guide. We learned so much about Israel. Uh, Matter of fact, he was so good uh, I've had him about three or four other times uh, in going back over there. And if you were to ask me uh, of all of the guides in Israel, who would you choose? I would choose a guy by the name of Malcolm uh, because I learned so much 
uh, from him. May, may I say a word to us this morning? If the Lord Jesus is not your guide, you're missing out on so much of this life. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. In John chapter 10 and verse 4, the Bible says he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because he knows they know his voice. Powerful words. You understand the shepherd is always out front. He's always leading. He's always directing. He's always guiding. He's not like a cowboy. A cowboy is not leading cattle. The cowboy has to get behind the cows and the cowboy has to drive the cattle, but that's not true with the shepherd. The shepherd is leading out of love out front. Uh, you know the reason that a lot of people don't follow Jesus? I found this to be true in my pastorate. The reason a lot of people don't follow Jesus is because they have it in their mind that if I begin to follow Jesus, then I got to keep this rule, I got to keep that rule, and I got to keep this law, and I got to keep that law, and this regulation, and this regulation. And I, I'm just not about rules and regulations, so I'm not going to follow Jesus. Can I just say to you, Following Jesus Christ is not about do's and don'ts. It's about one who loves you and is going to lead you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let me give you number three. Not only does he love me when I hurt and leads me when I follow, he looks for me when I wander off. How many of y'all ever wonder? How many of you ever just go astray every once in a while? You know, the fact of the matter is that's true of all of us. We all have a tendency to drift. We all have a tendency to stray off. It's part of our human nature. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says that uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. It's just human nature uh, to wonder. Uh, how many of you are parents? Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. How many parents? How many of you had to teach your kids to get lost? <laughs> we, we never did have to. That, that's just not part of our training. We raised a couple of them. I, I will never forget one of the most frustrating days in my wife's life as a parent was when she took Kevin shopping with her one time. And, and, and while she was looking at dresses and blouses, that little rascal ran off and he hid in one of those clothes racks, got up under there where she couldn't see him, and she panicked and went all over the place trying to find that boy. Now, he wasn't taught to do that. It was just his nature to do that, just like it's our nature to wander off and to stray and to get lost. But God says, I will be your good shepherd. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And there are many of you, in some sense or another today, you're kind of there. I don't really know which direction that I need to go in my life right now. I don't know if I ought to take this job that's been offered to me right now. I don't know if I should change schools right now. I just don't know if I need to go into a different career path right now. I don't know what to do about this uh, financial situation that I am facing. I, I, I'm kind of lost as to what to do about uh, some of these broken relationships that I have in my life. And you just kind of wandered off and kind of astray and you're kind of confused and a little disoriented as to where you are in life right now saying, do I let go of this? Do I hold on to that? Maybe it's because you don't have a guide now, when, when, when Kevin wandered off like that, what did Kathy do about it? 
did she just brush it off and say, well, kids are going to be kids, you know. I can assure you that didn't happen. So what did she do? Now, I don't tell you, she, she, she grabbed him up pretty good and she disciplined him for it. Now, was she disciplining out of hate? Absolutely not. She was disciplining because of what might happen in the future if he did it again. Now, now think with me for just a minute about discipline and about punishment. Now, sometimes uh, the sheep would wander off and the shepherd would go get him and the sheep would wander off again and the shepherd would go get him again and go get him. And he had this propensity to wander off. The loving shepherd then oftentimes would take that sheep and break that sheep's leg to keep that sheep from wandering off. Was the shepherd punishing the sheep for what the sheep had done? No. The shepherd was disciplining the sheep in order to save that sheep's life for what he might do somewhere down the road. Let me just say to you, God will put a limp in you sometimes. Not because of what you have done, but to keep you safe for what might be ahead. I, I've talked to I don't know how many people in my ministry and, and, and some grown men just weeping and crying. Well, preacher, I'm going through what I'm going through right now because of what I did in my past and my past is caught up with me and God's punishing me for what I did back. Wrong, 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 wrong. Stinking thinking. You understand this with me. For There's a major difference in punishment and discipline. Punishment is for crimes that you have done. Discipline is to keep you safe for what might be in the future. And if you have this concept of God that every time that you mess up, every time that you fail, every time that you do stupid, that God's got one of these big clubs and he's about to bop you right over the head with it, you won't bring yourself back to God when you have that concept. But if you see him as the good shepherd who is rescuing the sheep, who is restoring the sheep, when you mess up and do stupid, you're more likely to come back to the good shepherd so that he could make right that which was wrong and love on you in the midst of of your hurt. Let, let, let me say, there's a big difference in punishment and discipline. You, you understand something? If you are a child of God, if you are one of his sheep, he's not going to punish you for, you, you say, when will I, will I ever be, will I ever have to uh, pay for my sins? Absolutely not. Because Jesus paid for your sin on Calvary's cross. He took the punishment for your sin on Calvary's cross. He paid the debt. He suffered where you should have suffered. And for you to be punished for sins that you have uh, done in your heart and life would be double punishment. And it's saying back to God, God, it wasn't enough for what Jesus did. I got to suffer for it too. Um, when, when, when affliction comes, may, maybe you ought not to ask why. Maybe I'll just get to the place when you ask, uh, God, what do you want me to learn in the midst of all of this? It, this is a little parenthetical deal. <laughs> most of the problems and most of the pain that we go through in this life are self-inflicted. 
And they're self-inflicted because we don't know the principles and the precepts of the Word of God. And we spend more time watching and listening stuff that we don't believe rather than reading the stuff that we do believe. You say, how, how, how can I avoid this self-inflicted pain? Have a time in your life every day that you spend in the Word of God. A quiet time when you hear and read and understand what God wants you to do in your life. And when you know it, you can avoid the things that you ought not to do that's going to bring you pain. Oh, well, let me go on. Number four, he, he lifts me when I fall. I may have got ahead of myself there a few minutes ago, but the fact of the matter is you all agreed with me that we wander off. And when we as sheep wander off, sometimes we stumble. And when we wander off and when we stumble, it sometimes leads to a fall. And we mess up. So how does Jesus respond to us when we do stupid? Well, well, listen to the word of God. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you, take, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? That's just common sense. If my sheep falls in a pit, I don't care what day of the week it is. I'm, it's just common sense. I don't want my sheep to die, so I'm going to reach down in there and I'm going to lift him out. Amen? It's just common sense. So he asked the question, how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It's just good sense. He says, if, if God does that for a sheep, how much more loved by God than, than sheep are we? And how much more important are we than a sheep? If God does that, now you got to get this stuff right, folks. I, I'm just telling you you, you, you really need to get this principle right. When you mess up, when you fail, when you stumble and fall, God is not there to razz you. God is not there to scold you and to punish you. If that were true, then every time that you failed, you wouldn't go back to God. But God is there to restore you and rescue you every time that you fall. Suppose right now that you were just walking by and innocently fell into a pit. Maybe it's 30 feet deep. Now, now here's what the Buddhist would tell you. The, the Buddhist would tell you, well, it's just karma. You know, it's just meant to happen. You're okay. It's just, uh, this is the way that it's supposed to be. A Muslim would come by, a follower of Muhammad, and he would look at you down there in that pit and say, hmm, you broke one of Allah's commands. You deserve to be there. A Hindu would come by and say, it's just an illusion. You're really not in a pit. The pit may be in you. Just an illusion. But Jesus comes by, and Jesus lifts you out of the pit. New ager come by, new ager would say, hmm, well, all you've got to do is just imagine that you can get out of that pit and you'll be out. If you can think it, you can do it. But Jesus lifts you out of the pit. Jesus says, let me give you a lift. And he puts that hook down in there. And before you know it, you're out. When I'm hurting, he loves me. He leads me if I will follow. He looks for me when I wander off. And then finally, he locks me when I trust him. I used the word lock because I couldn't come up with any other word that began with L. and It just sounded good, so I used it. But it is a principle in the word of God that absolutely turned my world right side up when I was 20 years old. When I finally realized that it was the grace of God that saved me, not of works, lest we would brag about it. And that I couldn't have lived good enough to have saved myself. It, it, salvation is not about your good outweighing your bad to the point that God says, okay, great, you got it. What a tragedy the cross would be 
and a travesty that the cross would be if somehow, some way, you and I could have earned salvation. So coming to grips with the fact that I am saved by grace through faith and that not of myself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What an amazing thought and insight that became to me. But let me tell you what else happened the very day that I got saved and somebody took the word of God and they pointed me to the scripture when I realized for the first time in my life, not only did I not have it in myself to save myself, I don't have it in myself to keep myself saved. You can't keep yourself saved. Listen to the scripture. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is in John 10, 27. I give them, listen to this, I give them eternal life. How long is eternal? And they shall never, how long is that? They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Hallelujah. I don't know how many people have come up to me down through my ministry and have said, well, you know, I know what that says, Pastor, but here's the deal. I know that nobody else can take me out of the Father's hand, but, you know, I can take myself out of the Father's hand. Well, now, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm a man. And Scripture says, no man. And that included me, hallelujah. Somehow we got this concept that God's hand is just so small that I, we, we, we can just take our life and get out somewhere out over the edge and just happen in our own volition to either jump out or to fall out. You have a very poor concept of the size of God's hand. And he says that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. I've been locked up. Not only did he save me by his grace, he sealed me by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm his. I'm his. Now the question is this. Do you know the shepherd? He loves me when I'm hurting. He leads me when I follow. He lifts me when I fall. And he locks me when I trust him. Do you know the shepherd? Do you know the shepherd? Who who is your shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is my shepherd. And if you're here today without a shepherd, may I say to you, you won't last very long in this life. You won't last very long on your own. Pretty good deal with Jesus. He loves me when I hurt. He leads me when I follow. He looks for me when I wonder. He lifts me when I fall. He locks me when I trust him. You can't find a better deal than that. I don't care where you go. You can't find a better deal than that. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit would strive through every heart and every mind that's in this room right now and those that are watching by live stream and television. I pray that you would go to the very depths of each person's soul right now. And God, that you would reveal whether or not they are following the Good Shepherd. Lord, for those who do not have a shepherd, 
I ask in the name of Jesus today that they would come to grips with the fact that they are sinners in need of a Savior. Be willing to turn away from sin right now and trust you as Lord and Savior into their life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.